is the president and CEO of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And if you're like me, over the past three days, LPB has been your friend. <laughs> Beth Courtney. Well, <clears throat> I need to invite up our panelists because they are in the program. Or, or, or I could give you a grand Academy Award introduction if you're <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is so nice to see all of you here. We are going to be taping this today because, quite frankly, every story we had for Louisiana the State we're in this week was canceled. All of the, the budget that was supposed to be presented this morning postponed. Uh, and we decided, well, there was something really exciting going on, and it's the redistricting conference. So bear with us as we get all of this ready and we bring up the panelists. You know, for me, it's been interesting listening. I'm on the board of directors of PAR, and um, I, I'm suitably impressed by the speech we just heard. I, I'm, as I get older, I begin forgetting what I covered. But I remember, of course, when um, uh, you were discussing 2000, 2011, and uh, I think I went to the Capitol the first time in 1972. So that, things were very, very different. And lately, I've been doing reunions of the Constitutional Convention of CC73, which were interesting. So consequently, it's been a time where we look back on the past and really always look to the future to think, what are we going to be doing? So thank you all for being here. And uh, great. great to have you. All right. So Ken, are you ready? Are you good? Okay. So good morning, I'm Beth Courtney, President of Louisiana Public Broadcasting, and for much of my career I've been reporting on redistricting or drawing political boundaries in Louisiana. One of LPB's earliest stories that you may see on our archives concerns the Justice Department's rejection of Louisiana's planned congressional districts following the 1980 census. I'm interviewing Governor Treen, our first Republican governor since Reconstruction, and he's talking about why Congressman Bob Livingston and Congresswoman Lindy Boggs should not have their districts ripped apart. Of course, at one time we had, at that time, eight congressional districts, and now we have six. We also had a majority Democratic state legislature, and we now have a Republican majority at the state capitol. But what is new today are the numerous cases making their way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Wisconsin, Maryland, North Carolina, Texas. The law is clear that racial gerrymandering is unconstitutional. You may not draw districts diluting minority voting strength, but what if districts are drawn to favor certain parties? Well, is this simply a clever strategy or is it unconstitutional? Joining us today are Louisiana legislators and was going to be a former state senator who could not join us this morning. And I would like to introduce them now. Representative. Pat Smith of Baton Rouge, currently serving her third term in the Louisiana House, chair of the Legislative Black Caucus. She serves on the Important Appropriation Committee and is a leader in education issues in Louisiana. Uh, next to me, Senator Neil Reiser of Columbia, Louisiana. He operates funeral homes in Caldwell and LaSalle parishes. He's served on numerous boards of insurance and financial institutions. And Neil has also been involved as a candidate for Congress and statewide office. Now we have next to him Senator Norby Schaber, who has had a long and successful career in government relations. He's a graduate of Nichols State University in Thibodeau and is connected to Southwest Louisiana as a businessman and strong advocate on numerous financial committees at the Capitol. So we have three outstanding legislators who will all be term limited in 2020, so they may speak freely. So my first question to them based on the conversation we, uh, uh, the lecture, lecture we just heard from Robert is currently the Louisiana legislature is charged with drawing political boundaries. Do you think it is possible for this political body to draw fair districts? So Norby, I'm gonna begin with you. Well, I think fairness is certainly in the eye of the beholder, okay? If you're uh, in a majority party, uh, particularly when it comes to congressional districts, uh, you know, we have kind of maintained that uh, agreement, if you will, amongst legislators that uh, unless you really get into a true battle on lines in a certain area, that I'll draw my district, you draw your district, and, and hopefully 
you can appease as many legislators as you possibly can. Congressional district's a little bit like a knife fight, particularly when you're going to lose a member, which has been, you know, the, the circumstance that we've had uh, for so long. That's when, you know, uh, the parties that are in control really have uh, a, a lot more infinite in, uh, influence than, than the uh, minority parties. You see a lot of outside influence coming in uh, from, from D.C. Um, like Robert said, you don't see a whole lot of lobbyists around the Capitol, uh, but you probably see your congressmen and women more so uh, during that legislative time than, than any other legislative time. Uh, you know, I think I met with every congressman. Uh, at the time, I was serving as interim member of, of Senate Governmental Affairs, so I was intimately involved in the process. Uh, but everyone came and sat in my office and, and you know, they were, they were the ones making the promises for, for a change and, and asking for uh, a lot of favors in return. But uh, to answer the question, I don't know, you know, again, it's all about how many votes you got at the end of the day in the legislature. So possible. Possibly. <laughs> That's what I'm here. So, uh, interestingly, what do you think? You've been sort of uh, intimately involved, drawn, but also yeah. running. So, tell I'm me what you I have been, and, and as you know, and you might have already spoken on, there's a case the Supreme Court ruled on South Carolina just recently, so that's the reason this topic is relevant. As Senator Schaubauer spoke on, when we were redoing ours, it got very contentious. But it was a matter of getting the 20 votes. But it came more in to not, to me it was not party lines involved in it, but to say that it was not a, not a battle, I had a couple bills that had one that I thought I had 20 votes on right to the end, and we looked up and it was 19, Eric Pony, Representative Pony had a bill that came across that I ultimately modified and adopted, kind of a little bit cleaner than what I wanted. We felt like in our part of the world that we wanted two districts, as Senator Schaubauer said, we had lost one. When that happens, it's a lot more contentious. When you have those already set up like we do now, we don't have, if we don't end up losing one, I don't see the population decline, I don't think you'll have near the battle, but Senator Schaubauer, I can tell you where I have the utmost respect for him, and I will tell this story, was that he, that he had, I had one version of the bill, and he went and was basically, not basically, he did say, he said, you got half of my, half of my house, my kitchen's in, the, in one district, and my, and my bedroom's in another district, and that, it was uh, one of the best speeches Senator I've ever heard. He, he was very convincing on that. But uh, yeah, it's, it can be very much so that you have the congressmen that are, that are turf war someone, tell the reality of it. Um, they work hard at running those districts and to get to know those people and then to change it up, it can be it can be problematic. I mean, we, we lost one and, and that was in the southern part of the state and, and it, it, got, it got really rough. Uh, maybe we won't have that much so far again, but it does come down to the votes and the state, as you say, I've been a state candidate and I've been and, and the congressional world also is that that base, like the Cajun base, that, that's a strong group of members. So when you start talking about a group, I mean, it's, you're working as a whole and politics is the art of compromise and you have to compromise the past. To get there can be a challenge. So I'm going to go over to Pat right now and ask her, but basically you are saying you want it to be a legislative function as opposed to yeah, a commission. Yeah, yeah, not, yes, absolutely, because we are a republic. So those members, the, the population has voted us to come represent them at the state capitol. So yes, I would, I would think that it should stay. We are a republic and to leave it in a legislative form. So Pat, your impression. Well, you know, just like this panel looks, it's uh, unbalanced. <laughs> I, I do want to say that, that, um, that there are some concerns about redistricting coming up in 2021 and whether or not uh, we, be, we remain uh, as a complete Republican uh, Senate, Senate and House. Uh, I think there will be some concerns about uh, not only that, but making sure that the minority representation that we have doesn't diminish as well. Uh, and I was a part of that 2010-2011 uh, um, redistricting plan when we came up, and I'm surprised the senators have been so kind to um, the administration because their 20 votes came on the fact that the governor said he would not vote on anything but what we got. And so when the Senate made their decision, they had to go along with what the governor said because he was not going to accept anything other than those horizontal uh, 
the, the vertical districts that they get, they got horizontal, whichever one it is. But what we got in the north, you don't see the map there, but you have, uh, there, there were two coming down from the north, and he said he would, there were other plans that would have added, and he said he would not accept, he would veto anything else that came down, um, came to his office other than those plans. Uh, so that was contention for them, so they had to find the 20 votes to make sure that they got it to the governor's office to sign for the congressional districts. We, we didn't, the House doesn't deal with the congressional districts, we only deal with the legislature. And there were, were many contentious kinds of opportunities at that time. I can say we tried to get an additional, uh, other than the two, we got uh, additional uh, minority seats. Uh, in fact, the Black Caucus had made a path at that time. We did not need to have packed, packed districts in order to win in our areas. And we had talked about looking at that 65, 68% um, of minorities in a district rather than 80, 89, or 90% of minorities in a district. However, when it came down to looking at um, the fact that we had some individuals who balked at that idea of giving up the 90%, then uh, we, the, the Republicans went along with the fact that they kept some of those packed districts, which helped us to end up with only about two districts. But we did have some impacted districts as well, where a minority could win uh, based on the percentages that were there. But if you have a district in which you don't have a lot of diversity within the district itself, then does that affect the way you debate legislative issues? It, it is, uh, oftentimes, uh, but I think that if you look at how precinct lines are drawn, which is not done at the legislature, but at local levels, then that, is, that also affects where people are actually going to be voting. And so we talk about the legislature doing the redistricting, but precinct lines actually impact the redistricting process. One of the um, issues we always look at is community of interest, and you made reference to the fact that one of the um, possible changes in congressional redistricting last time was we were going to have Shreveport and Monroe across the state. It was going to be in, in one district. So, so I guess you're the representative of our northern part of the state. Do, do you think that then is a community? How do you define, think about in Louisiana, community of interest? Because we always say that we're very different across Louisiana. Sin Law is very different than Acadiana or Arklatex or Arklamis. Um, wow, what is a community of interest to you, Neil? And to answer that, and it, you know, someone who most certainly free to disagree with me, but when you start talking about the, um, the west part of the state, the similarities, when you start getting into Jennings, to me, you're leaving a little bit about the Acadian parishes, and you're entering in more of the Lake Charles, kind of more of the culture, and that culture seems to follow that more towards even towards Shreveport. When you get back to about Russin, and Russin is in the fifth, but when you start moving back to that area, so the culture starts kind of getting to be the same. So when you draw those districts, one of the things I want you to have is a culture, something that's in common. The fifth is probably the most broadly drawn because like in my own state senate district, I have 10.3% of the land mass in it just because it's a rural district. Washington Parish is a lot like Iowa Parish. So a lot of similarities, but that's when we came down and when you start losing a member and when you you make a single move, when you move them a number around, let's say you're gonna move a precinct around to get that done and you have it, it gets so, con so contentious that when you move the one, you move it down at home. And when you move that, well, it's just like pushing on a balloon, it's like the law of physics, it pushes something less in the state. When you move, when you start drawing these maps, so it's it's not as as simple as it sounds. So when you push that, when you push the one and on the minority district, when Congressman uh, Cedric, when Richmond he came, that was on my bill, on my version. We worked, and it, we had to come up the river and get around to make sure that we did have a district that would be represented in that matter. And if you cut through with any of them, any of the six we had, when you touch one and you make an agreement or try to help with another member. It's just like pushing on that balloon. It pushes it off, it pushes everything out. So you're having to reach all that around and you want the smallest deviation. So you're trying to keep, in a congressional district, they want that deviation as small as it can be. They actually want them to all be the same exact number. The precise same number of citizens inside those districts. So when you're talking about 
state senate or you're talking about the state house it's not that way so there lies in the major difficulty in drawing congressional districts is that that number has to be their deviation has to be very small and so that's um so but but uh, one of the criteria back to your point though is what what is the likeness and what is in common yes you need to you need to keep that in mind so community of interest for you and you made some very bold statements about that <laughs> well i think that if anyone is has a memory of what transpired in that particular session i was very much you know a, a neophyte to the political process i had just gotten there i didn't know a whole lot about the legislature at the time but i was still in the middle of it um, very much so <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so for, for one reason um it was unofficially decided that our congressman at the time in the old traditional third congressional district which had been congressman tozan's district for so long um, had just elected uh, now Attorney General Jeff Landry uh, he had been in, in Congress for but one term and it was uh, unofficially decided that his district our district my district the traditional coastal district the, the area that is uh, for the most part made up of current uh, minority whip Steve Scalise's district would be the sacrificial district it would be the one that would uh, have to um, endure the most compromise. And I so in this case, incumbency meant something, but I think incumbency meant everything due yeah. to the fact that that Congressman Landry, General Landry, I'll call him Jeff right now. <laughs> Jeff was the rookie, basically. You know that would have never happened had Billy Tozan still been the congressman. You know, um, had another person like Hunt Downer who had lost that race, who had a lot of respectability in the legislature, former speaker. If it would have been his district. You know, you might have seen some uh, some some different battles, but as Senator Riser uh, described, that point of whatever is decided that the number is going to be, I believe our number was 755, 755,000 souls in the district. It's got to be that Senate district have a deviation of plus four or, or minus four or something along those lines around that area. Congressional districts have to be to the number. Makes it very difficult. On top of that was the pre-clearance factor and the voting rights aspect of having to draw that minority minority district. And you have to remember, you are dealing with a tremendous, I mean, historic diaspora of population, of minority population out of New Orleans at the time. Okay, and you know, kind of to, to, uh, to go back to what Representative Smith said, just for the record about the Senate, I voted against every plan Neil Riser had. <laughs> Okay, every single one of them. Uh, I did help Senator uh, uh, Jackson pass two plans out of the Senate that were, gave us two minority majority dif districts, if I'm not mistaken, based on uh, more or less a, a homogenous, depending on your perspective, northern district uh, that kind of separated the top portion of the district into, I believe one of them had uh, a uh, a slide in, in uh, Mr. Travis's uh, deal where you had the I-20 corridor would have been a district. Correct. You would have had the mid portion of the state would have been a district. You would have kept Terrebonne and Lafouche together, which was a major theme uh, in passing those plans. Both plans got defeated in the House. One was not heard and uh, unfortunately that was a committee that was, was um, chaired by a great uh, state representative, now current president of Grambling, uh, Representative Rick Gallo went on to serve in the Senate. Couldn't have had a better chairman. We didn't, unfortunately, due to leadership in the House, didn't get one bill heard and one bill died in committee. Uh, and those were passed against, like Representative Smith said, against the will of the governor who said, we'll veto them. So it made uh, some interesting bedfellows politically to have some uh, a, a state senator from Shreveport and a state senator from Chauvin coming together to buck the governor and, and frankly buck a majority of the members of the Senate. So Pat, as you, the Black Caucus that you have chaired a number of times, what is your strategy then around redistricting coming up? Well, we're deciding that now, but I think that the most important thing is that we are, are still um, looking at the premise that we don't feel that minority districts need to be packed. Uh, it's, they should not be packed. Because when you pack one minority district, you then create another white district. 
And I think that's the most important thing that we need to look at is how the minority representation is in the House and the Senate at this point in time and at least to maintain the numbers and see if there are any opportunities to increase as we did in 2010. Uh, but we're concerned, of course, we're in, uh, as, as in, 20, in 2011, I'm not sure people realize that while Rick Gallo chaired the committee for uh, uh, redistricting, the speaker at that time increased the number of individuals on the committee to 25, making it a full majority Republican. It was, it was not that way to begin with. And so when those individuals were placed on that committee to, to 25 individuals, it was fully and a, uh, overwhelmingly uh, on the Republican committee. So therefore, whatever was going to happen, was going to happen based on the Republicans and the, and the, the Speaker and what they wanted to happen, have, what plan they wanted to actually pass. But I think the, but Rick, Rick had a plan as well. He, he proposed that plan to the committee uh, and they declined that plan. Uh, and there were other plans that were put forward. But we will be looking at, I'm sure, how do we develop our own plan for the Black Caucus. It's a major topic for us right now on how we will be looking at redistricting in 2021 because, as I said, we want to make sure that we can either increase definitely uh, minority seats and also to maintain the ones we have. So there is a very different Justice Department right now. Correct. What is your sense of the role? There's no more pre-clearance. That was always the story we were always covering, the pre-clearance. Have we heard it? What's happening? What's going to happen now in, with the, what's your feeling about the existing Justice Department? Well, I, you know, I, I'll say this. Uh, prior to the session, the, the members of, I believe it was the House uh, H&GA and the Senate H&GA, I know from the Senate Governmental Affairs, went up to D.C. And you got to remember the time you had an African-American president, African-American attorney general, and at the time, the, the, the head was um, someone that I guess today would be described as hyper-partisan uh, because he is the head of the Democratic Party. It was Tom Perez. Okay, we went up and met with him in his office with staff and kind of went over the parameters. I said, you know, there's, there's no way that uh, we're going to put forward a plan that isn't going to undergo the, the utmost scrutiny uh, in terms of fairness, uh, given, you know, the political players in D.C. at the time. When we passed, when we eventually passed Senator Rogers' plan, I said, there is no way that this plan gets passed by this Justice Department. Passed on the first trial. Mm -hmm. Passed on the first trial. And, and, you know, even given the districts that we had that gave alternative uh, plans, like, like Senator Jackson's plan, where we had a competitive minority, second minority district, uh, y'all, we were reaching, okay? I mean, it was, it was a, a struggle to put together those minority populations, keeping under the, the context of we got to make this look as homogenous as possible. We got to make it look uh, as non gerrymandered as possible. And you know, we see it with Senate redistricting, uh, something that impacted me particularly because of the Voting Rights Act, the dysphoria from Orleans. We had to lose a minority majority district from Orleans, but well, from the Greater New Orleans area had to go to where the African-American population was, all right? Well, in trying to find it, it was in the river. It's, no, it's, it's not a you know, happenstance that Congressman Richmond's district is just a elongated, larger version of what was, at the time, um, a district that would eventually be won by Senator Troy Brown, now had by, won by, I uh, see Senator Price is here. Uh, I believe it, it encompasses, Ed, what, eight? Parishes, eight parishes. Okay, so y y it's difficult uh, to, to get that type of stuff done, uh, even when you have the best intentions at, at heart. And, and to echo something that uh, Representative Smith said, when we brought Senator Jackson's plan to the House, we had two that had passed the Senate. One didn't get a hearing in HMGA because of the factors she described. One got a hearing in House and Governmental Affairs. And when we walked into the committee, we had the votes. We had the votes. I sat right behind Senator Jackson. She was at the table fighting off the lions uh, on that plan, and we lost. 
So the Justice At Department heart, is different now, though. Completely. The Supreme I mean, Court is different now. But my point in all that is, here you had every factor going yeah. in the favor, which you would think would be, uh, you know, a, 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 a Justice Department that would rule in favor of what, at the time, would have been two minority districts, and it didn't play out that way. So the question of will the Justice Department be fair, I think it all comes down to the law and how difficult it will be for our state to put forward something that they would have an objection to, given now that we don't even have to do pre-clear. And let's talk about reaching that objective. When you, I read an article just recently talking about a metro area in the U.S. and the rural area. So we're, we're the rest of the states, I don't see us now, but potentially could see us here once again just the reconfiguration of the population. So we have 42 rural parishes in this state. And so the representation, so you end up on that. Tennessee Parish has about 5,200. I live in a parish, of, a town of 300, 10,500. Those individuals, you have to make sure they have a voice too. So that's one of the reasons you're talking about drawing and getting something with similarities and similar kind of values through that is that you got to be careful with, with that component of it too. Well, don't you have the sense too, if you're in some districts, maybe you have a wasted vote. That's that's one of the phrases they talk about now too. And, so and that's the way people begin to feel if they if they live if they live in a rural area, why, why should I even vote? We're talking about all, everything, statewide on down. Why should I even vote? Because it doesn't matter. Because New Orleans and Baton Rouge, and the end Shreveport, they have the vote. So those and, and we want everybody to be a part, but you continue to see that voter turnout be lower in the rural areas. Yeah, so do you agree that a, a wasted vote, then people don't turn out as much? Or? That's a possibility for sure. Um, and it's, it also involves how much outreach is done to individuals to ensure that they do go to the polls. Uh, you can't just say that people just don't go to the polls because they just don't want to vote. But they've got to also understand what's on the ballot and be able to know who the candidates are and whether or not that candidate's, candidate has their best interest at heart. So therefore, you know, you, you've got to make sure that outreach is there as well for a person to understand that that vote counts. Look at, look at Virginia. I mean, was it Virginia? Yeah. It was uh, a tie vote right. uh, and has to be decided by a, a, a lottery of some kind. So uh, it's important that people vote because you can win by one or two votes and people need to understand that. So we we're talking again about the commonality of interest, and so so Cedric Richmond represents Baton Rouge and New Orleans. It is it, of course we we have the advocate doing Baton Rouge and New Orleans, and whatever we're journalistically we're now doing a variety of things. It, is is that a stretch or not? Uh, well, I think at first we thought it was. Uh, the, uh, the, the the most important thing is that um, uh, people were able to come together and understand that. It was a minority district trying to keep that keep a minority in Congress, uh, and that was the idea of, of having that minority district. And only, the only way to get it was to move farther into Baton Rouge. You couldn't go anywhere else to pick up the minority uh, precincts in order to add them to that district too. So um, I, I think we're we've consigned to the fact that now um, Richmond is in Baton Rouge and. Uh, in New Orleans, and uh, people call on him just like, and he's an office in Baton Rouge, so they call on him just like they do in New Orleans. Yeah. So, I don't hear any of you calling for an outside group, uh, the, the work that they par did, or a consulting, you know, to, to give you some other input. You, But do you agree that public transparency and hearings are important? Well, the, the individuals, that, those groups, there's some wonderful groups that are, have very talented people on it that do provide a lot of information and we want those to continue but as as i spoke before i know the other two members can speak for themselves so the question was is did it still be a legislative process and yes that is still my belief on that we are representing the people of the state no matter who it might be that were the rural parish where they might be and i wouldn't want to see outside group that come in might have a true special interest that would push a different agenda so talking from your personal experience, I remember one state legislator um, from Southwest Louisiana who used to say, my constituents don't know if I'm in Baton Rouge or Washington. They kind of think it's the same thing. Do you I, think- That very far from the truth, do you? I, I, get, I get that as asked in the grocery store or something. I'm sure every member probably gets that. And they, a lot of people don't know when we're in session when we're out of session. 
So how do you get then public, meaningful public input into this process? You know, speaking from, and, and I'll go back to the, uh, the minority majority Senate district. When, when that district, number one, it, it was pretty much had to be drawn first. Right, because you were yeah, yeah. we drew that. We were literally that moving first. one district completely on to another place in the state, wherever that might be. It eventually uh, found itself to the river region, which was, you know, we kind of assumed that that it would be there. We didn't know how elongated it would be. You know, it stretches from Donisonville all the way down to Thibodeau. Okay, well that impacted our area particularly. Now at the time. Uh, I'm gonna give you the old Terrebonne Lafouche triangle, folks. Okay. At the time, <laughs> you had the traditional Senate District 20, which was at the bottom, and as uh, Mr. Scott referenced earlier, it was the first time that the two districts, the St. Mary District and what is would be considered the St. Charles District, both in one district represented by the President of the Senate. Both of those folks were term limited and you had a freshman in the middle, okay? Compounded with the fact that from the north, coming down like Neil was talking about, pushing that balloon, you had the you know, influx of a district that even though it would only be a portion, only, you know, I, I, Ed, I can't remember how many, how many precincts uh, came into Northern Lafouche Parish, all right? But it changed the whole dynamics of Thibodeau. Thibodeau now has four senators representing, which I think is a great thing, personally. <laughs> uh, but you would have sworn it was the worst thing that ever happened in Lafouche Parish. So going to your point about outside interest, and Neil can attest to this, I'm sure Ms. Smith can as well. There were all kind of plans submitted by all kind of folks, okay? The Thibodeau Chamber, the South Lafouche Chamber, the Terrebonne Chamber, they were coming up drawing, drawing districts uh, and saying, hey, what about this, what about this? All self-serving, all self-interest. Uh, not taking into account the, 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 the metrics needed and how it would affect other areas. So um, to that point about can other folks submit plans, I strongly encourage it, but I wholeheartedly agree with Neil. I mean, it's a legislative process. It needs to be done by us. Mm -hmm. So, Pat, you think technology, we've talked about how things have changed. It used to be Mike Bear sat there at the computer entering things and then talk about it on Channel 9. I mean, I remember thinking, really? This was in the early days of spitting out plans of sort of, and now anybody, our grandchildren, can go online with software and look at things. How is technology going to change this? Oh, it changed it to actually make it a little more efficient. You can sit at a computer and uh, watch how the lines are impacting any other district as you move them, or, uh, or any precinct that you move, how it impacts the districts that are contiguous to your district. So uh, technology plays a big role in that, and I think Glenn and um, Lynn Kemp and those folks really enjoy the fact that they can push, uh, use a mouse rather than <laughs> using their hands to draw lines. Uh, that it's it's just come to that point. But I wanted to make a, a, one other comment about the outside groups. Um, I think it's a it's an unknown because outside groups you never know who's going to be the outside group, along with the fact that. Who appoints an outside group? What are the, uh, you know, who's, who's actually the judge? Well, well, but sometimes, you know, if you, some of those groups are appointed by the constituency people. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, you really want to know what their uh, particular values are when, it looks, when they look at a, a map or what have you. But I think it's important that anyone who has a plan can present it to whomever, House or the Senate. And we had a plan, we had a plan the last time as well. So I think it's important that you know, folks be a part of the process. The hearings are great. I think people have an opportunity to uh, provide input as, as to who they'd like to see, where they'd like to be, uh, whether the lines are drawn to help them or hurt them. Uh, they have that opportunity to have that input. So it is very important to be transparent during the process. So what do you think about the role of the governor in all this? Because clearly, I mean, obviously, we're, we were having a shift. I've been through the time where, in fact, I've known many legislators who were Democrats and now Republicans, or congressmen who were Democrats, or Dave Tozan, and became a Republican. And now we have a certainly uh, predominant Republican legislature and a Democratic governor. So what, how do you think that's going to play out, the role of the governor? In this? From, from a legislative standpoint, to a congressional standpoint, I mean, it's alpha and omega, right? I mean, as, as much as the governor was involved in drawing of the congressional district, that's how little he was involved in drawing of the legislative districts. Right. 
So what do you think the role of the governor is strong, how it should be? Well, the, the governor, you have the separation, so <laughs> what he chooses to do when he gets that governor, a potential governor, whoever the governor may be at that time, it's going to be their individual decision. As far as the influence, just like they pose influence on legislation and on votes and committees, every governor's done that and every governor's <laughs> continued to do that. They have a floor staff that does that, they have chief of staff that's pushing their agenda. So it's the same process of getting the votes, I think, from the governor's perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone's an individual, so I would assume that that individual would have something that they would might agree or disagree with again. But when we start to recap it again, just so you know the complexity of it, and I mentioned it once though, if we divide it up here into five different, well six different groups, and drew up plans, you would see how difficult it is to end up to achieve that goal. When we're talking about pushing, I said there are Secretary of the Senate out here today, and I can tell you, we had all, all seven congressmen come in. I mean, these were like 20 hour days to come in. Their plan was going to work masterfully. All of them. I mean, I'm not going to exclude anyone. Theirs was the perfect model. It did the perfect lowest deviation. You come in and you start overlaying them, though. They're not looking at the other ones, and it would just be just scattered all over the place. Some of them were leaving precincts out, literally. Had white spots. We'd go through and we'd look at it, and be and you you have the amount of have, uh, uh, staff time that you have to deal with that also. The staff is the ones that's actually getting running. These these numbers can't be kind of close or out. That looks kind of good. They have to be calculated exactly. So when you're coming, you bring something to committee. It takes a lot of mathematical patience to go back through and get that analytical data because if you send something that's messed up like that, you've really got a problem. But once that that that's where you will see, and I think redistricting nationwide it will always be that way because you're talking once again you're talking reduction in population somewhere in areas and others though. But to get that deviation small and you've got that many personalities. You'll have the discussion. Not as not as we lose another one. I don't think the next one will be be that that difficult. So, Pat, it seems though that the Republican Party, if we look at Washington now, and certainly like the case in Texas as they were drawing lines, <coughs> the Republicans seemed to have been advanced in their they very cleverly used as a strategy redistricting to advance their numbers. Exactly. That's exactly what they did. <laughs> and, and now the Democrats are trying to do that as well. Well, I, I'm not sure. If, I think the most important thing is the balance that you, you receive. Uh, if you're going to go on partisan uh, gerrymandering, which is what it actually is, then you're going to end up with those packed districts. And I think that uh, a lot of people are not ready for, are not wanting to see that happen. Uh, so therefore, the partisan gerrymandering is going to have a, a, a very um, hard time getting through, I think even in Louisiana, because we already have enough packed districts. We need to see how to unpack to make them more balanced to be able to have people to be able to have a vote for the, for the person that they uh, don't want to see represented. Representing them. So with all these cases coming up, the Wisconsin, I mean, those, so let's look at what are the Supreme Court rules that you could have partisan drawing? It, it's, it's okay. It's constitutional. What would that impact be? Well, then you would have to be fighting for your life <laughs> and then making sure that those lines are drawn so that you, your, the constituency base that you have in your district should be someone, uh, as, as I look at my district, for instance, it's very diverse. My, my district doesn't even reach 70%. It's in the 60s. And it, it varies from 65 to 60. So uh, I think it's important that when you look at how you, who you represent and how you represent those persons, the people who are in the districts want to have a say. And when you go on party lines, then you are taking the people out of the process as well by not having them vote that one man, one vote. Well, as we are today looking at whether government is going to shut down in Washington, certainly party lines is the huge exactly. <clears throat> call. And we this is creeping even more into the Louisiana legislature. So do we see things playing out at the Louisiana legislature that are paying, playing out in Washington? Well, I'll say this from, you know, in other states, the gerrymandering issue 
could could probably revolve around partisanship, okay? Because you know, it's very obvious that a lot of states. Let's use Mississippi and Alabama, for example. Homogenous, you know, culturally, religiously, politically, they're they're, they're basically the same state, flipped over, right? One of the and there's a couple of former legislators here that I see. Um, Louisiana is a difficult state to govern because there are so many cultural differences. I mean, legitimate cultural differences. That's a good point. Okay, the North Shore couldn't be more different than the Bayou. All right, than Shreveport is. Okay, from from Lake Charles. Uh, uh, and and oddly enough, they're <laughs> split congressionally. Um, but it's a difficult difficult state to govern for, for that cultural diversity. So when you have things like uh, the loss of a, a congressional representative and people are, are like Pat Smed fight, fighting for their lives uh, for representation, you don't necessarily see that, co I mean, don't get me wrong, it exists, let's not be naive. You don't see that, that hardcore coalescing around a, a partisan ideology so much as it is a regionality of, of you know, uh, I'll go back to our instance where we were losing our congressman uh, we were lobbying for uh, the, the keeping uh, of, of a district that resembled as much as possible what the old third looked like because, you know, we have a lot of old European boundaries that still exist. For example, you've got Lake Pontchartrain, right? That's a major deviator from the north and the south shore. On our side, you've got uh, the Atchafalaya Basin, which is big, basically the geographical split from the eastern side and the western side of the state. So those things really play into into your your your, your decision making and the, the 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 sort of the coalescing of votes on what's acceptable and who's going to side with you. And it you know it as we say it ain't so much if you're going to be a Republican or a Democrat you know mm -hmm. on, on this it's it's which side the body you from right. <laughs> yeah, it was when Senator Schaubach mentions that. I think that's a good summary for this state is that last redistricting was more turf battle. That there was, and from my perspective on Hamlet, it was in the Senate, I can't speak for the House, but we don't, it's not Republican and Democrats fighting. We don't have that such an issue. It was truly the turf war. So when Senator Shaw Barry gave his speech on the floor, he had legitimate points. I mean, his points were legitimate. Was that on the one where y'all trying to give me three congressmen or two? That's one, that's one where you got one vote and you thought you won. That's where I had another vote for Spud Pepper normally. He looked at the board and he still thought he had won that amendment. <laughs> that's a, but he, but he, was, he, was, he was exactly right. And that's, but it was, um, it, the point being is that you have the cultural differences and you want to maintain those together. You know, over the course of the 40 years that I've been looking at the legislature, uh, yes. That was always, that played out, and that was true. And we, you can look at our archives, and you can see all of these stories. Uh, prior to that, of course, it was, are you long or anti-long? But one of the things we, of course, have seen, Pat, is that race is still playing a very big role in Louisiana, has historically, and will you see it in the future. And, and uh, as the uh, senator said, they couldn't speak for the House, but uh, partisanship played a big role in the issue we had in North Louisiana. Uh, the Republican and the Democrat issue that we had in trying to create another uh, minority seat in that area to move some in some precincts which were not only minority but some Democrat into a Republican district and uh, that, that House member just totally did not want that to happen. So, you know, th it does come into play when you're having uh, discussions and trying to make a balance on uh, giving individuals the right to be able to vote for a person that they feel is represented. So incumbency is important though, clearly. Yeah, and we don't have very many women there oh. to be incumbents. But we're having term limits and so things may change, right? That's correct. In 2021, there'll be a lot of new people in the legislature. Uh, we, governor, the, the leadership in both the House and the Senate uh, will probably be different as well. So. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in 2021, but 2020 will tell us. <laughs> I was trying to describe to someone, I was saying, you know, when I was looking at it a couple of times, it was sort of like you were in a game of musical chairs, and it was 
you're going around in a circle. And if, as we were losing in the congressional district, it was like, as you indicated, uh, the last person in was the first person out. And it was sort of a game of personality. Eight, seven, six. Yeah, yeah. And, and eight, I, seven, six. Right. I think, you know, barring any unforeseen incidents, this will be a normal redistricting process. You won't have to deal with so many districts moving from one portion of the state, such a huge diaspora of population moving. Um, I think that, that, you know, hopefully we're, do, we're doing progress, uh, positive and progressive things in Louisiana that are going to grow our population. And the next change that we see, hopefully, fingers crossed, will be the addition of a, another representative in the Congress. And that, I think that will be a welcome thing. It's not going to happen this go round. Keep our fingers crossed. Keep, keep putting forward some, some good policy, growing our economy. You could see it in 31, but again, that will be a good change, whereas this, this past one was just a knife fight because of the fact that we were losing such a, a valuable piece of, of political uh, capital, and that was a, a congressional representative. So any final thoughts? You all? I'm going to open it up and ask um, the audience if they want to ask anything. Do you all have any final thoughts? Uh, basically, I'm just hoping that in 2021, uh, the, the legislature will understand the importance of having diversity and ensure that you know, minorities are represented, other minorities are represented in the, in the House and Senate as well, because it depends on whether or not you have a large Hispanic or a large Asian population that comes up. They want to also play a role in being able to have someone that they can vote for that understands their quality of life as well. So uh, I'm just hoping that there's going to be a good balance uh, when we draw these lines and that we won't be fighting uh, for our lives. And maybe we won't have a hurricane because I think of right. Congressman Gao, and, uh, the first, what, Vietnamese yeah. origin, who was, we sent uh, to Washington, which was really a product of the shifting population in after Katrina. Uh, any questions? You all, we have about 10 minutes. Yes. Uh, Representative Smith mentioned precincts, how precincts affect how districts are drawn. How are precincts drawn? Go ahead. The local, uh, from your local levels, the precincts are put together because they, uh, they, uh, the your council members uh, and your clerk of courts and whatever, when they get together, they can uh, decide on whether or not a precinct needs to go away, um, uh, and or actually be expanded. So that's at your local level that's done. If you notice about uh, individuals getting notices that they have to vote in a different precinct, that's done uh, through the local level. Do they do that every 10 years? I'm not sure. I mean, do they do it at the same time frame? Local? They're supposed to yeah, be district. Sure. Right? Yeah, local. Local. I, see, I see who I know sure. and the obvious is yes. Yeah, okay. Great. Am I correct on that, Glenn? Uh, the, as far as the precincts? Glenn Kemp? That's correct on the precincts, correct? Precincts aren't changed. Uh, but it's not on the local. They stay local. stable. Unless council matically changes, right. unless the council changes, right? Unless they're coming apart. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And any other? Way in the back. So, sorry, don't mind repeating the question. I will, I will repeat the question. Yeah. You have a mic. You have a mic. There is a mic. Changing locations has changed our dynamic a little bit here. This question is for Senator Schaubert. How has the division of the coastal parishes by congressional districts hurt or helped the ability to lobby for funding for CPRA and coastal restoration? Well, it, you know, it's a, that's an excellent question because at the end of the day, you know, that is a factor that plays into how you draw your lines as well. Okay, uh, the, the, the homogeny of a district, uh, the knowledge of, of the incumbent about particular issues, you know, it's almost like when, when you're going to elect someone, right? You, you start playing into how much. Well, this how does this guy from Lake Charles know anything about the Atchafalaya Basin? You know things like you start really, really fact, trying to factor that in. Because we lost a, a member, okay? It was we knew that the old versions of the coastal districts would would basically remain the same. Uh, if anything, they would, hypothetically, increase upward, right? Well, with the, the, the way the plan turned out, 
and I'm trying to do my hand motions as the way I see the state, not so much as you see the state. As it played out, it was actually a compression. Um, so I can, I'm never going to forget this, and if, if, if Congressman Scalise was here, he, he could tell the story better than I can. We knew, in effect, that the battlefront would be kind of that Assumption, St. Mary, Terrebonne, Lafouche, St. Charles kind of area. We didn't know how it would swing, but we knew that that would be that confluence point. Okay, that's just where it would be. And you have to remember, at the time, economy played a huge portion on why Terrebonne and Lafouche was such a factor because not a whole lot of people realize it, and it certainly isn't the case now because of the downturn in the economy. But due to the upturn in the economy, the Terrebonne, home of Terrebonne MSA was the fifth largest in the state. We were bigger than Lake Charles, bigger than Monroe, bigger than Alexandria. Okay? So what happens when you have a lot of population? You become that point where everybody, those other districts kind of have to go. We're blessed, frankly. It was a, it was a crummy thing that happened uh, to us. But now, that compression from the north gave us a Baton Rouge district that produced Garrett Graves. Who knows more about uh, coastal issues, other than me, than <laughs> Garrett Graves, right? So you have the minority whip of the House, if the Republicans maintain control and Speaker Ryan goes the way of the dodo. Who knows, we may be talking about Speaker Scalise. All right, and so you'll have the Speaker of the House, certainly the majority whip of the House, fighting for your coastal funding. So to answer your question, it really, it really worked out for us. And another thing, Congressman Bustani at the time sat on appropriations. You know, if he doesn't decide to run for the open U.S. Senate seat, we would have some some strong folks up there fighting for that coastal funding. So, you know, it we knew what was going to happen. We didn't think it was going to happen the way it happened. And if you have coastal erosion, many of us are going to end up being on the coast as well. We're in the well, exactly. There's that. I was trying to keep it positive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one other question. Yes. Um, one of the topics that you keep coming around to is term limits. Uh, from a constituent point of view, we hear a lot about the positives and negatives of that. Curious from a legislative point of view, from a legislative point of view, um, do you think that term limits are, you know, how do you think they affect the negotiations when it comes to redistricting? All right. Uh, I'll start because actually I came in in 08 uh, as one of the, uh, when we lost about 60 some members in the House and um, it affected the, the redistricting because so many people had never gone through it, uh, didn't understand the process. So uh, we had to have a lot, there was a big learning curve there for a lot of individuals uh, who came into the house. Uh, I, I believe the term limits really uh, tends to send your knowledgeable people away uh, if they're not in another chamber. But uh, when folks uh, gain a lot of knowledge in uh, not only just a particular area, but uh, serving the legislature and constituents are uh, happy with them, uh, to us, term limits should be people voting people out, not having a law to actually vote people out. Uh, because you do lo lose a lot of a knowledgeable basis uh, for people who leave. Well, Pat, you're on appropriations, and it's taken some of the members <laughs> several years yes. to figure out <clears throat> what they're doing. Absolutely. I've been on appropriations since I've been there. Um, but I also served in government before on the school board, but people coming into um, the, the House and serving on appropriations and not knowing how the budget actually works, uh, they've had to have outside orientations go on so that they can understand the, um, what the budget actually does and what it contains. Reaction to term limits? I would go back and, and back. You, you make a lot of valid points. When Senator Schaubert was talking about he's most knowledgeable of the, the governor from Grazie, and the, and the Senate is. So everybody comes into that building when they come with a special degree of talent. And so he knows it. I mean, he sees the offshore boats, he knows how all of that works. And it does take some water number of years to do that. And when you lose that talent that goes out, the, you could have an area that 
live pretty much like a district we're talking about now might have a member that gets gets elected. You could end up with somebody that's, that has much more talent. But it takes more than a couple of years to learn a budget with all the agencies in it. Just like the congressional members right now, uh, Norby was talking about it. You have them on appropriations you have here and there. It's hard as one member to learn and specialize and be the, be the master of all, you know, it, it, during those trades. So I've served on revenue, I've served on money committees. That's the area I know, know the best. And on other topics, and when that knowledge base leaves, yeah, it's a, it's a void. And uh, I'll see it continue to be one. Uh, we have term limits. I came in on term limits. But uh, I think the catch up process or the learning and representing the people at the level that needs to be represented is always going to be a challenge. My, you know, my, my perspective is a, a tad bit unique, and let me just answer the question first before I, I kind of pontificate on it. But I believe in term limits, but I think that you need, from a legislative standpoint, not three, but, but, but four. That, that enables you to, to serve with no more than four governors, no less than two. Um, I got elected in 2009, September of 2009, I took office. My senator resigned and took over our local levy district because we were still reeling from the impact of some severe storms at Terrebonne Parish and, and we really needed to have an expert and Senator Dupre was an expert on coastal matters and growing up the majority of, of all the legislation that's currently on the books created CPRA. We were blessed to get him to forego his <coughs> legislative time left and, and, and was happy that the, uh, the district hired him to run it. Been a tremendous asset. But I got sworn in on September 9th. Had I gotten sworn in on January 1st, I would have gotten a whole other term. So instead of serving, your, you, get your three dip, you get your three terms, that's 12 years. Had I been sworn in in January, I got another term, that would have been 14. But instead of that, I'm serving 10. You keep up with that? We've got a couple okay. members. <laughs> all right. So to, to go to what Neil kind of said about expertise, all right, the, the reason why I think you need term limits uh, is because you're blessed and lucky when you get someone that takes the job seriously, that is not in it for themselves, that is in it for the people, who, who wants to become a master of the subject matter that affects their area or affects the state. Look, we've got a lot of unselfish folks out there that don't act in what I call a police jury mentality, whereas I'm just going to represent my district and we're going to do whatever's good for my district and that's all we're going to do. Some folks go, I want to do what's best for the state of Louisiana, period. Okay, and, and my district will benefit from that. On the other hand, go back to the Alpha, the, that uh, Alpha and Omega. You, we elect some knuckleheads too, y'all. All right, <laughs> we elect some knuckleheads. Okay, and term limits. Whether the whether whether the voters of that particular district are informed or not, term limits sweeps them out. So, again, po politics, as you know, anybody took a poli sci class. You know, it's about that spectrum and the swing of that pendulum. One day you're gonna be in, in, in the penthouse, next day you might be in the outhouse. <laughs> so, uh, on, on that auspicious note. <laughs> well, I got a better way to say it. On some days, you the windshield. Other days, you're above. <laughs> well, I, I thank you all for being with us. Thank, thank you, you Norby, Neil, and Pat. And um, actually, it's quite encouraging that so many people uh, have turned out today to discuss a topic that is terribly important. And we will be following uh, in the months to come as we see some of the Supreme Court decisions. We hope that will be coming down in legal action. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. Good afternoon. Thank